hope you all are keeping yourself healthy and safe during this pandemic it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar ccm presents business of architecture post covid 19 it's heartwarming to see such a fabulous response to this webinar series brought to you by architect and interiors india thank you all for taking time out and being here today my name is indrajit sauji i head the construction and design vertical for itp in india and i'll be your host today before beginning the webinar i would like to know if audio and video are clear if at all you have any issues with the communication please do let us know by the chat so that we can sort it out soon the chat box is available at the bottom of your screen let me begin with a brief introduction about itp itp media group is one of the largest foreign media companies in india the group now publishes more than 100 weekly and monthly magazines and has a wide portfolio of market leading digital properties some of our well known global titles include magazines like harper's bazaar vogue time out cosmopolitan grazia construction week architect and interiors india and more similar prominent titles across industry verticals in india we have seven titles including architect and interiors india architect and interiors india is a flagship title and is amongst the most respected and widely read b2b titles in its domain now let me come back to today's topic business of architecture post covid 19 we all have been witnessing and going through the toughest times of our life none of us have experienced this before it is definitely going to change the way we work and the way we conduct our businesses but before that do we really consider architecture as a business many of our designer friends are still hesitant to consider it as a business the most common complaint i hear about architect uh, from architect is that architecture schools did not teach them enough about the business of architecture although students take a professional practice course in architectural schools but most begin their careers knowing very little about business as young professionals you might not think it is important for you to know about business besides you are just a cat jockey or a bim ninja or a design maverick but the better you understand design fees for a project the better you manage your time which in turn will increase the chance of project being successful and profitable this will definitely improve your chances of promotion and will help you to prepare for future leadership roles please please do not underestimate its value you may broadly classify the business of architecture in two parts number one the money of the, um, the uh, your money or the architectural firms money you work for and number 2 the client's money you must manage both efficiently to run a successful architectural firm if you falter on one then the other will follow this episode of the webinar series brings together subject experts in the field which will touch upon the mention points and on the immediate and long term challenges facing architects once works restarts how will projects uh, be designed post covid 19 keep in mind social distancing will materials like glass which are now being used extensively at airports hotels restaurants play a role post covid 19 era we will chat with these leading design experts and learn from their experiences and expertise as to how we can prepare ourselves better and survive and succeed to make an impact we are looking forward to an interactive and engaging session and we look forward to learn from our audiences as well hence we are going to screen a poll during the session the poll will be live on the screen for a minute request each one of you to cast your votes the results of the poll will be shared in due course and we can have the panelists view on the trends as well we'll be running a q and a at the end of the webinar so we have enabled our ask a question feature it's on the control panel at the bottom of your screen so if you have any questions just pop up them in there and if you miss anything don't worry we'll be sending around on demand recording to your mailbox and it will soon be available on our website as well 
in case if you wish to come live and pose any questions to the panelist you may do so by clicking the hand icon in the control panel and my team will get in touch with you we'll try to take a few live questions and we'll try to answer as many as possible and to give the time permits without any further delay let me introduce our partner for today's session cisejam flat glass Cisejam is a global player of glass industry and has production facilities spanning across 10 countries namely Turkey Bulgaria Romania Germany Slovakia Hungary Russia Italy Egypt and India and they are a big supporter of Make in India initiative as well Cisejam operates in four main product uh, product categories consisting of architectural automotive solar energy glass and glass for home appliances Cisejam flat glass aims at meeting all customer expectations in its targeted market with its high efficiency quality product start uh, state of the art technology and its efforts focused on saving energy for environment protection thank you cisejam for partnering with us and helping us rake up this most pertinent pertinent issue that the design industry is facing today now without any further delay let me introduce the moderator for today Mr Vibhav Srivastava group group publishing director ITP Media over to you Vibhav you may please introduce the legendary panel well it's uh, thank you Indiji that was quite a introduction i think you know we've been to lots of webinars but i think that was a very crisp and nice orientation the do's and the don'ts and what do i say a extremely legendary panel that i see husna rahman from uh, from bangalore supriya tyagraj and perkins and eastman vivek very dear friend carl and all these panel need no introduction i think all the audiences have got you know many mails introduction about them so i would rather use this time to make sure that we talk about a subject which is so near and dear to all of us and the subject which really has triggered multiple emotions questions uncertainty uncertainty uh, uncertainties and we still don't have the answer but how can i leave and as i just wanted to come back to you because you already started working and in india just about uh, you know unlock one that has started and there is a lot of apprehension in the country and you can see on the faces as well as people they are all very eager to listen to you uh, in in spite of the social distancing and the kind of product company that you are which is like world known and most famous what is your view how would projects take off how would people work i mean would you like to shed some light yes ashra thank you bipur thank you everybody it's a pleasure to be here with you uh actually i'm in istanbul and uh so happy to be with indian architects and architects from all over the world uh i would like i have a small presentation i would like to share my screen first of all okay so can you see me clearly now yes. Uh, actually, we are experiencing uh, difficult times all over the world. I sincerely hope that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. As the largest flat glass producer of Europe, we continue production in our factories all over the world, including India. Uh, we have uh, we have sales in more than 110 countries. Uh, we responded to covid immediately as carrying our work to online digital platforms and we continue to give glass consultancy for architectural projects as we did before covid now it's time to redesign our daily life after recover the only way we are getting closer to a covid-19 free world is the proper practice of social distancing At Shishajam uh, Flat Glass, we have got a clear-cut solution. That's a glass apart. Uh, we are socially animals, and uh, we thrive on human interaction. And with the smart use of glass, uh, we can still enjoy human interaction without the risks of human touch. Glass allows us to see each other, to talk to each other. Uh, 
when, when we have the proper design for it. It's also a barrier. It provides us social distancing perfectly. Uh, in the near future, we may give up working in open plan offices and start working in glass cubicles or uh, glass rooms like this. Uh, there are too many uh, benefits of glass in workplaces. It's hygienic, easy to clean, uh, eco-friendly and long-lasting. Uh, glass has scratch, impact and breakage resistance at the same time. After COVID-19, we'll get used to see uh, these solutions more often, for example, in a fancy restaurant or in our uh, hairdresser's salon. The possibilities are clearly endless, and so are the solutions uh, with glass. As Shisha Jam glass, a uh, flat glass, we believe creating value in and for architecture. Uh, we organize architectural events uh, with the participation of world-famous architects uh, such as Su Fujimoto, Winnie Mouse, Dan Stuber, Gard Maia, and so on. Uh, they were our guests before COVID in Istanbul. Uh, they inspired uh, many young architects and architectural students with their uh, design approaches and their understanding about use of glass in their projects. Uh, after COVID, uh, we carried those transparency meetings to digital platforms. Uh, from here, I would like to invite all the uh, attendees of this panel uh, to uh, these two uh, digital events. Uh, they will be at the end of this month. Uh, 3XN's founder, Kim Nielsen, and Patrick Shoemaker from Zaha Edit will be our guests. Uh, as Shisha Jam uh, Flat Glass, uh, we are reaching architects and design world uh, with digital publications such as Transparent Architecture. Uh, it's a digital bulletin and a website to inspire design with glass. It pre presents artistic approaches, innovative uses, and the latest developments in glass technology and industry. Furthermore, I would like to introduce our headquarters in Istanbul, which we call Heart of Glass. The project's architectural design belongs to world famous SOM group uh, and Turkish architectural firm design group. We have an experience center in our headquarters, which invites us to an impressive journey and exploration towards the nature of glass. Together with our R&D department, uh, which is based in Istanbul, we come together with architects and engineers for brainstorming in order to shape the future of the glass. We have many, many reference projects all over the world, of course, including India. But uh, one of our latest prestigious project is Istanbul Airport. The airport will become the uh, world's largest airport terminal under one single roof when all the phases are finished. Uh, phase one has more than 2,000 200,000 meters square glazing area in total. A special temperable solar control lobby glass has been developed for the project together with our R&D department, architectural design group and the consultants. Glazing is completed only in 15 months. So uh, I would like to invite you to our headquarters and experience center in order to develop innovative ideas together like we did uh, before COVID and after COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Estra. That was quite, a, quite an elaborate one. And I see my team says that a lot of people have joined in, in the interest of the audience. Uh, let me just quickly walk you to the panelists again because uh, they should know, and a lot of them people have joined now. So we have Vivek Gupta, principal architect, Arvind Vivek and Associates. We and have Carl Bhadia, senior associate, uh, architect, Hafiz contractor. We have Husna Rahman, principal creative director, Fulcrum Studio. And then we have Supriya Thyagrajan, principal director, Perkins and Eastman. So audience, that's a quite a lineup. And as you see, there's a lot of excitement. You've gone mute before. Thank you. This is something that I'm still learning. 
so bear with me so yeah, i was yeah. i was saying you know it's a, such an interesting topic uh, vivek and karl and gusna and supriya we all work together i said what do we do there is so much of talk happening about covid but nobody is talking about the solution the positivity the road ahead and that got us to thinking what kind of a panel should we do which will give this session and from this session the audience will have a big take away so we have a boutique firm like husna and we have large firms on the other side like carl vivek and perkinson so you get a huge aspect so audience you will get a lot to understand and lot to really learn from this so let me get on the straight in the question and you know be prudent for the audience to also understand each of the panelists where do they come from a certain background of course everybody knows them but hear it from them so i have just to this to the panelists all of you have earned a great degree of success in balancing your personal design philosophy and the client's needs and perhaps even your responsible to responsibility to society at large but everyone has a starting point could you describe your journey or perhaps share an anecdote that was a turning point for you in, as an architect so we can start with husna first and then we take it subsequently uh well for me uh the journey began uh in its own uh mellifuous rhythm wherein uh, i did not believe that uh i was born to design per se i studied in bangalore till i was 18 and then it was a trip to london to at that point explore the possibility of design that i realized that i was definitely the kind of person who could not be uh, subjected to a unilateral or a unidimensional arena i needed a field which was terribly left brain in as much as there should be no answer per se nothing from a book wherein there is an answer to that and that is the end and the beginning i wanted a field which was limitless and boundless and which involved my life and the living of it as much as it did my craft it was during the time that i walked through beautiful museums in london that i ate fine and interesting food that i heard beautiful sounds in the theaters and the operas and just felt like the world is my oyster which you do at the age of 21 and then i kind of heard these sounds inside of me and the sensations which made me instinctively know that this was my domain this is where i wanted to find myself and this is the path i wanted to pursue so i uh, then got admitted into parson school of design new york and realized that just when you reach the edge of the cliff and think that you will fall into the abyss is when you find wings to fly into the sky and uh, this is the field which is an interdisciplinary vocabulary architecture really brings together the arts and the sciences the poetry the logic the um, explorations of the world technologies engineering and you know the heartbeat from the inner goings on of your workings and soul the philosophy that you bring to it and uh, given that it is this immense world then which drives your art and your lines on paper i i decided that this is where i want to spend my time and with each yeah the portals have just become more immense and uh, more exciting because it's been 20 years but uh, every day i wake up and i feel like uh, there is further to go and there's more to learn uh, just the endlessness and the infinite capacity of what it can offer you and how it can explore your inner being i want to surprise myself i want to wake up and say who am i today what can i learn today from you know people in my field from someone in the office from a book that i read will a poem be able to inform how i draw will a conversation with my 7 year old and his curiosity feed into my life so it's these tentacles which really evolve into that being this you know alive and growing and searching being that i find extremely replete with magic and with motion and emotion 
Wow, wow, wow. Fantastic. wow. Absolutely brilliant, you know, endless, limitless. And people who don't know, actually, Husna is a very, very good writer herself. You know, so before character. I have to say, I have yeah. to say, architecture's game has been literature's loss. <laughs> Looks like <laughs> writing a book Just today. Hang and, on. Yeah, I, am, I can imagine. I can imagine. I mean, after this poetic kind of introduction, I find that whatever I'm trying to say or do oh. is absolutely pedestrian. Mm, I'm, I'm sure still anyway. I'm still mm. waiting for that life to take that one turn where suddenly I feel <laughs> that I can play God. But all I do is that I love the profession that I'm in. I think architecture is one profession where the, the, the manifestation is a form, is, is, is a physical form, uh, which often outlives the creator, which is the best thing. Every day, as Usna said, is a new day. You wake up as a different personality because of the project that you're doing, the client that you are uh, working for, the climate that you're working in, the context that you're going to be uh, dealing with. So I think there is a new morning every day for an architect. And that newness of the profession has, has kept us going, you know. There is no falling into the groove kind of a thing that happens in the life of an architect. Every day is a challenge. I'm not saying that other professions don't meet that challenge. But this challenge is something that at the end of it, when your professional efforts manifest, I think they manifest in such a beautiful form. Uh, mm. Beautiful in the sense it is, uh, it is beautiful for the client, it's beautiful for, for your own self sometimes. Uh, and the manifestation, I think that gives you the power. No other profession has that physical manifestation. You know, a surgeon goes on repeating the same, a gastrointestinal surgeon will yeah. do the surgery for the stomach every day. Uh, a lawyer will go to the court and fight the cases basis of the same CRPC or the, or the criminal law or the civil law. Uh, a chartered accountant always deals with numbers and everything. I think architects are the only people who deal with a new subject every day, with a mm -hmm. new client literally every day, with a new climate or a context every day, and at least in every project that they're doing. So we are lucky guys. So I, 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 I also, I also want to say uh, we are like um, uh, alongside with the architects, media guys as well. <laughs> no, no, continue. I just want to say we are also the lucky ones. And that's about it. I can't be as uh, um, wonderfully elucidative as uh, Husna has been. What, no, no, but very good. But uh, Vivek, uh, I think audience would also like to know some of these secrets. You want to share that or you want to keep it later? Secrets of what? Uh, in so terms no of your, your, start, your starting point, you advocated an it's, architect, that's fine. Everything is fine. Anything that you wanted with. It's been accidental. I spoke about it. It's been accidental. I was supposed okay. to be doing my master's in the US. Unfortunately, uh, we were graduating around Operation Blue Star time. I couldn't submit my thesis. My admissions for my master's were in place in the US. I couldn't go. I was at a loss. I had never planned life. I didn't know what I was going to do. And um, I come from a very small place called Bikane. There was nobody could even pronounce architecture. Yes, this is all so, what we want to know. Yeah. 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 So that's how I came to Delhi. I started my practice without any agenda, without anything, uh, without knowing how tomorrow is going to be. But I was at it. I was at it. The only thing I understood very early in life that, uh, you know, life is not cherry picking, you know. Uh, and architecture is not going to be a low-hanging fruit. I will have to work assiduously at mm -hmm. it all with all my might. And I think I've said this, that the only compliment till now I've got from my wife is that I never gave up. <laughs> I never gave up, really. I just went on doing whatever I was Super, doing. super, super. Never give up. Carl, you want to do a quick one? So I don't know what to say after Husna and Vivek have put it so eloquently. I think they speak for all of us. But uh, for me, uh, frankly, uh, I come from a family of doctors and, you know, being the black sheep, uh, I just, I couldn't see myself studying anything really. So architecture was uh, by accident, just by the love of doing art and fooling around. So I'm happy to be here. And uh, the turning moment for me was frankly, uh, you know, when I failed in my second year, I got thrown out of college for, you know, hosting a strike and, you know, oh. copying in an exam and doing all sorts of things. But that was great for me. I this is super, wife. I would say. Sounds familiar. I, I met so, my wife because of that. I 
landed up at Hafiz's doorstep because of that. And uh, since then, not look back. Uh, frankly, uh, I love, uh, you know, doing anything to do with the built environment. So working in Hafiz's office at that scale keeps me completely motivated. And, uh, you know, having him as a mentor, uh, nobody can ask for better. So I'm happy. Mm. Well, Carl, so much to, uh, to learn about you. Wow. So that is tremendous. I'm sure a lot of people don't know. I, I'm knowing it for the first time. Uh, Supya, would you like to share some of the sure. secrets like this? How did architecture happen to you? Again, it's, it was not by choice. Um, uh, my mother's family comes from four generations of uh, people in the construction industry. And um, so for her, she was the one instrumental in, in sort of making me choose architecture. But I think it was my educational uh, experience, both at undergrad and graduate school, uh, that sort of defined how I saw myself contribute to the built environment. And um, I always wanted to do projects that had, um, that had, that had some meaning, were meaningful, um, had some legacy uh, to leave behind, um, had impact on the people who use it as well as the society. And with, I'm fortunate with Perkins Eastman, I'm able to do all of that. Uh, so it's, it's a very fulfilling uh, sort of, you know, a role for me. Um, managing projects or managing the office does not leave me uh, with enough time to design. And that's fine because at least I'm part of something uh, that's, that's big and uh, it means a lot to wake up and do that every single day. Wonderful, Supriya. And I know they are doing some incredible work. She will talk about her work. And, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, from a partner standpoint, Ezra herself is an architect. Ezra, can you hear me? Yeah. And uh, we're just going to complete this round till Mithali takes the next one. Ezra, would you like to share your, your background in terms of how you loved architecture? Was it by design or did, like for a couple of uh, people here when it was accidental? Uh, actually, uh, during high school, I was planning to study fine arts and I have a very close friend. Uh, her uncle was an architect uh, visiting his office, design office, uh, and uh, spending all my time with my uh, best friend, I decided to study architecture. Uh, then I attended Middle East Technical University. Um, after graduation, I started to work in one of the uh, biggest architectural design office in Ankara, the capital city. Uh, I was very lucky uh, when I attended. Uh, they had a competition and they won the competition for two, two big university campuses. First, I started uh, to work on uh, university campus design. I designed everything. Uh, I was very young, just, just at the age of 21. I designed everything, including stairs, uh, wet areas, shafts, anything. And then uh, even most of the prestigious buildings at the same time. Then, um, but, uh, then I moved to a construction firm and started to uh, design for them. Uh, first, uh, I started designing hotels. Uh, then uh, I was very lucky uh, because those projects are completed. I saw the results of my uh, designs. Uh, but uh, 15 years ago, I moved to Istanbul uh, due to my husband's choices. Uh, and now, um, when I moved to Istanbul uh, with a small child at the age of one, uh, I decided to be uh, a bit away from uh, architecture because uh, at an architectural office, I have to work unfortunately six days uh, uh, sometimes uh, more than 15 hours so I couldn't I, I have to made it make a choice with my child and also for uh, with my career uh, then at that moment uh, by chance I started working in Shishijan flat glass as a uh, um, and started giving glass consultancy for projects that's how it started uh, actually, uh, I'm very lucky because uh, in Shishan Flat Glass, 
uh, we are working with architects uh, giving glass consultancy all over the world. So I used to design, but now I'm uh, working with all the architects and uh, I'm just, uh, I, I have the chance to uh, attend all the conferences, architectural conferences all over the world. So uh, for 15 years, I designed in an architectural office, but now for the, uh, for this, uh, for now at the moment, I found myself uh, more in architecture and enjoying it a lot. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I think that brings us, uh, in the sense, to a, to a kind of familiarity and also some of the hidden things of, of each of the panelists and how things happen to them in the design. Nathali, can you take the next one? Absolutely. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, we've got such a wonderful panel. With, we're so lucky that everybody has such a unique perspective and such unique personalities that they're bringing to the table. But not just that. I think more importantly, what we both sort of allu alluded to earlier about how each of you runs a very or represents a very unique practice as well, very different from, you know, each other. Uh, I wanted to understand from that point of view, you know, given that we're in the situation that we find ourselves in now, how does each of, uh, you know, how does each practice uh, sort of uh, dealing with this current situation, especially in terms of, you know, survival, because it's, it's been long now. It's, it's not a one month or two month thing. It's, it's going on for a while now, and it's probably going to go on for another uh, few months by the looks of it. Uh, how are each of you, you know, surviving at this particular time? Because I think that'll, you know, be very inspiring for a lot of people to hear. So maybe Husna, if we could start with you. Survival is a many layered um, demon in, in this time, isn't it? Uh, there are so many layers to our survival. One, of course, is the physiological. I mean, when we rang in the new year in 2020, little did any one of us think that our lives as we know it would be threatened, that staying alive would become the mandate of the year. Uh, that's the physiological reality. The psychological one of survival, I think, has far deeper implications in that people's lives have been torpedoed. And the disillusionment, the anxiety, and the despondence that comes from that requires to be managed. So whether it's yourself, the people who work with you, or the larger realm and circle around you, I think responding to a heightened um, sense of disorientation is a very key emotional component of our survival. There are people I know whose spirit has triumphed. There's a lady, Fatima B, who walked 1,500 miles to fetch her son from Andhra. And I think that's when you see the human spirit just face every obstacle and come out uh, absolutely luminous. And there are times when people's expectations have plummeted to the extent where their lives have been marginalized to the extent that they've been unable to cope and done absolutely uh, unmentionable things, dark things on a panel that, uh, you know, we're talking about now, you know, what the extents to which people can go. So there's this sense constantly of survival on those two levels, which I think are very important before we actually talk about the economic aspect of it, because it's only when we clear these two hurdles can we actually face the third. So when we're looking at the economic aspect, I think it's just a, a matter of, like we talked about earlier, hopefully we've nurtured our craft as an art rather than a business. And have we done that and sown those important seeds of creating a body of work which has the ability to withstand the hard times? Uh, then I think that we are in a position to hopefully be positive enough to think that uh, we might just survive the onslaught. Uh, the ability to have uh, realized right from the start that yes, we learned the business and the business will follow and the accounts where I'm concerned and all the very other aspects of the public relations, the marketing, all of that will fit into place or not. But if you can go in there and do what you do and create something with every inch of your being every single time, uh, then perhaps you have enough right now to be able to say that it might sustain you or still bring the client back with uh, the ability to think that you can do more and further. Uh, so I think it's, it's testing all of our 
emotional wills, but uh, on an economic spectrum, we are cogs in a wheel and we need for the momentum to be built all around us for us to spread that bounty. Mm -hmm. And uh, being in the residential sector, I personally feel a little more buoyant because I think that homes now have come to become our universe. They are more than places to live and relax. They are places to work. They are schools for our children. They are centers of wellness. They are places to see the sky and interact with the birds and feel all that you can be. So uh, I'm hoping that that will uh, allow people to realize that we need more in our homes and that spring of um, the residential work will continue its momentum forward. Right, lovely. Vivek, if I could sort of come to you after that, uh, you know, the, very interestingly, Husnaz, uh, you know, said that uh, your resolve and, to, uh, you know, the resolve to stay positive and take things one day at a time, essentially, uh, you know, and, and sort of build on that. Uh, do you look at it similarly or, you know, what is your approach to the whole thing? You know, I've lived my life, Mitali, that there is no tomorrow because tomorrow when it comes, it's today. So I've lived my life like that. So I actually have never planned anything in life. And I live for the day and I take each day as it comes. So basically this last, whatever, 70, 80 days, uh, to be honest, I haven't upskilled myself in anything. I'll be very honest. I've, there is there's no room in me. My mind is a monkey. I, I just can't concentrate on trying to upskill myself. But what I've been able to do is to reimagine, to recalibrate, to reinvent a few things that I already knew, you know, in a manner that you have the luxury of time, perhaps. The luxury of not really time, time I always had, but luxury of staying in a place physically to be able to enjoy those things, you know. So uh, things that were always seen uh, in the kind of the rear view screen, I'm able to focus on them today. So that's been yeah. the revelation of the last uh, few days. What I've been able to do is reinvent things that I always knew or I always wanted to do, but didn't find, uh, as I said, not because of paucity of time, but uh, mind being a monkey everywhere. Now I have nowhere to go. The mind has everywhere to go, but I don't have anywhere to go. So I am forced to uh, engage with the things that I would rather engage than to let it go and wander everywhere. So I do a lot of cooking. I've been looking at the plants. I've been, uh, luckily we have a beautiful terrace garden. I planted some, not me, but the Mali had planted some beautiful vegetables, which I actually used for the initial part of the lockdown when we were literally every day, we were making food out of the vegetables that we had uh, grown in the terrace garden. That also made me think, as I said, I was saying earlier that, you know, for me, getting out of the house, incidents, people, memories, things, they trigger emotions. And that emotion is my architecture. I'm a very intuitive architecture architect. I do not plan. I do not study. I literally do not know any other architects excepting friends who are architects. I have no idea about any international architect, no big names, nothing. So being an intuitive architect, everything that I saw, a story that I could look at, a, a picture that I could look at, you know, inspired me to create things and everything. And all these things have led me to be able to reinvent my thought process to do architecture, which is going to be engaging in a slightly different manner. You know, I never lived in a bubble. I never lived in a bubble. So I knew that there is poverty. I knew I deal with the migrant population. I deal with the labor on the side. I sit with them and eat. So there is nothing that is new that has come as a bolt out of the blue for me. Uh, I was well aware of what happens in this country, how we are uh, the lucky few and how people are marginalized and everything. So only thing, and also there is no f newfound empathy in me at all. You know, there is, so from that point of view, nothing new has happened. All that has happened is that I've got there is a pause, and in that pause, I am reimagining things in the manner, perhaps that is a little more uh, peaceful, I would say, uh, a little less theatrical, uh, and a little less, uh, what is that word, uh, uh, more ephemeral, because I, I feel 
uh, as Vishnu was saying, life is so ephemeral today and you realize more than ever before. And some of my friends know I'm an extremely hypochondriac guy. The only thing that I'm scared about is, is, is life per se, because I say you are not born with anything. You can always, so even your architecture that's there in you, you will always be able to create better architecture through learnings that come about in everyday uh, life, new challenges that come through your architecture, through your project, through your clients and everything, because architecture is a response. And as long as you have challenges, you will respond. So yeah, well, that's, that's the way I, that's the way I've had uh, my time. Yeah. Architecture is, is a response. That's so true. And I think what you've, uh, you know, sort of brought up, which is, which is so important and which we don't sort of realize is that we need to tap into our emotions ever so often we don't we don't do it and this has kind of given us a chance to do that and uh, to sort of reinvent and like you said uh, upskill yourself that is something that you don't pause to think about uh, in a regular situation but this is kind of forced us to go there even uh, for a lot of us uh, that's I haven't upskilled myself I said I haven't upskilled myself you know somebody wanted me to share this thing yesterday when we were saying I said sorry I can't even do that so Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Carl, what about you? Uh, do you sort of, uh, you know, fall into that same zone? Are you, because each of us has a dis- different response and as a practice as well, you have a very different response to, this, to the situation. How have you, you know, worked around it? I think our challenges have been very different from what was just explained by Vivek and Usna. Uh, primarily, uh, the, I, I would like to split these challenges into personal and professional because uh, from a personal point of view, you know, I live in uh, Vali Prabhadevi, Mumbai, which is probably the hotspot, not of Mumbai, but the whole country. So, you know, we live, live in a block of flats. Uh, there are issues within the apartment complex. There are issues of neighboring buildings getting locked down. Uh, you know, I have spent a lot of time personally on the, on the managing committee of the society doing stuff, you know, preparing rules and regulations for garbage removal and this and that, which I never thought I would do. So that's on the personal front Mm -hmm. while also worrying about, you know, kids at home and, you know, all of that on the professional front, uh, you know, uh, as a practice, uh, I think uh, Hafiz contractor's office, uh, you know, he, I don't think realized when it grew from five to 500, it just grew. And uh, we've never faced a situation where, uh, you know, suddenly the tap stops and, uh, you know, we have, we're still responsible for 500 people. Uh, it happened in the month of March where, you know, people expect something new for the, you know, for the next year, uh, uh, you know, and the tap stopped and, you know, there's a lot of personal things that we had to deal with as a practice on and, you know, put your individual requirement aside that, you know, that's way down the list. But, you know, a lot of people on the, on the edge who, you know, are paying EMIs for their car and vehicle and all of that, you know, a lot of people on the edge. So, so that's taken up a lot of our time. But when it comes to the practice, I think uh, nice things have come out of this lockdown. We found new ways to work. Person even used a single day in the last three months. And, uh, you know, if, if that continues, I don't see why we're going to need paper going forward. Uh, we've found different relationships between, uh, you know, me, my boss, Hafiz, or my, you know, my colleagues in the office. We figured out which wavelengths match each other. So you automatically realize that, you know, some people that you didn't spend so much time with in the office, suddenly you're spending more time with them because the wavelength matches. And on the e-platform, you know, uh, everyone's been able to contribute where people say that you can only do it in the office. But I mean, we found that it's worked quite well here as well. And the most important thing is we're also designing differently. Uh, you know, looking at this whole migrant, pop, you know, migrant problem, labor problem in the country, you know, being more sustainable. We started thinking about design in a much more different way. You know, can it be done with less labor? Uh, you know, can it be done? Can it be built in the factory and brought to the site? So it's made us think differently. I mean, to me, this uh, three months has been a fantastic learning curve. And uh, for, I think, people with that mindset, uh, they, you know, I hope that they will just come out of this much stronger. Absolutely. 
Lovely. I mean, that's such that's an interesting perspective. And I think, Supriya, you would probably, uh, you know, have something to add to that because you also represent a very large firm. Uh, sure. How do you, how have you dealt with it? Is it similar for you? And also, uh, very importantly, the labor issue that Akal just alluded to. Uh, could you maybe throw some light on how you are dealing with that particularly? That would be an interesting, uh, you know, sort of point. Um, so I mean, we, we run a thousand people practice. So the, the challenge is, is bigger. Um, it's more complex. Uh, but we've also had the history because we are a 40 year old firm about certain recessions you know, that have happened in the past. So one learning, one big learning was over the last recession, uh, we lost a lot of talent to other industries and that talent never came back. So this time, consciously and proactively, we're trying to keep our young talent engaged, um, motivated, and connected. Um, and working from home, all of that is a big challenge. But, some, but fortunately, technology has supported, I think, more and more of uh, the leadership's time is going and making sure that people talk to each other, the projects are going on. So engagement uh, with the young staff. Uh, has been very crucial. Second is engagement with your clients. Uh, we have been going, uh, sort of approaching clients to be, to offer support in this time. These are difficult times. And any kind of professional help that we can offer. A lot of our clients are in healthcare sector. A lot of them are looking to convert their existing facilities to uh, deal with this pandemic. Um, a lot of our um, work, you know, talent is at the forefront dealing with this uh, COVID pandemic in actually in New York City, we're working with the healthcare providers there. We are trying to help some of our clients in India. I think all of that is given us enough uh, energy, motivation, and constant engagement is, is helping us move forward. So the lockdown doesn't feel like a lockdown. It feels like you're actually doing things every single day. Um, and a lot of energy is going into that. And it all feels very positive. Um, it all feels, uh, you know, extremely, um, in a, in a positive light talking about the migrant worker issues. I mean, I, it's a much larger problem and I don't think architects can solve that, uh, in any way, but one of the ways that our clients have very successfully managed to keep a lot of their, uh, uh, worker staff on, on ground was to give them, um, uh, enough food, a sanitized place to stay. And information, uh, information about this pandemic and virus saying that stay, we'll take care of you. Uh, you will have work, you will have money. If you try to leave and go back and, you know, try to rush to get back, it will be far more dangerous for you. And I think they've successfully managed to keep 400 families on, on site and have started construction work already at full swing right now. So I think these are just learnings that, you know, we can all have, uh, but the larger issue is uh, is far more complex that you know we don't we don't think we can solve single handedly i think it's a much complex issue absolutely we can only try and get sorry, a Nathani, i just want to interject here i just want to tell you yeah sorry i just wanted to interject here and because there's been so much of din and noise about helping the people and you know i've been saying this on various forums now and various people were asking for things to do for the workers and everything i've been saying that Charity is not going to do anything to do. It's empowerment yeah. that's going to do that. Correct. COVID or no COVID. I mean, we are in the construction line. When we go to the site, we go and see our site and nothing else. I think I don't know how many of us actually go to the labor camps because each site has labor juggies over there. How many of us actually go? I'm thankful to the government today that there is a compulsion for having those portable toilets. I'm an old timer. I've seen that their site meant a place where people could actually take a bottle and go out into the jungle. You know, so I mean, the least that we can do going forward, COVID or no COVID, is to empower those people. There has to be a fresh at every site. You know, Supriya and Carl, you yeah. run large practices, you have large projects. I think if our sites have that, if there is an Anganwadi kind of a thing, if there is a thing where adult education can be there. I think that's an empowerment. If these people are empowered, we will not be having this situation. I'm yeah, sorry absolutely. for having interjected, but I, I feel very strongly about yeah, that. You know, suddenly the entire architectural community thinks uh, that they will play God. They will try and help this, that, the other. They will have various charities. I don't think that's an answer at all. Yeah, 
Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's Go an ahead, important call. No, no, absolutely. Very well taken. And I think we've had a lot to sort of ponder on because we've got a lot of points on board. If we can just, uh, you know, put in, bring in a, a poll question, Indrajit, if you could just bring the audience in and, you know, take a poll question at this point. You're on mute, Indrajit. The question, will architect and design witness a complete transformation post-COVID? Agree, undecided, disagree. So all... I think even the panelists can weigh in on this one. Yeah, we'll take the panelist view on the like, results that we see and like how the audience responds to this. And what is the audience response? Yeah, we'll, we'll show you. Yeah, we'll get it. Indiji, we'll by the time you get the uh, response, you do you like, there are a lot of questions that I see. Can you take one of... Yeah. Audience, audience question. I'll try to. This particular question is by Bhavan Makwana. He wants to know, do you see any changes in the way indoor spaces will be redesigned due to the current COVID-19 pandemic? Which segments, hotels, hospitals, commercial spaces, IT firms, etc., will witness the design change? So, any of the panelists can take this. Uh, Carl, would you like to take? And of course, that you're doing that, uh, you know, the huge project in hospitality in Aero City. And I think audience would also like to know, it's like almost like. So I think uh, yeah. it's a good question. The uh, to be to be very honest. The maximum change will be seen in in uh, in project segments where uh, you know people are visiting, so hospitality, and where uh, I mean let's understand one thing. I mean you know social distancing and putting up glass here and there is also to some extent a privilege uh, in projects that can afford it. I think in in a lot of uh, you know housing projects and this and that you're not going to be able to afford this privilege. So I think in hospitality, in, in, uh, in, in workspace, we will see more change. Uh, but in, in housing and all, I think the change will be very, very less. I feel that housing, the main change is going to be, you know, every builder who sold uh, a two and a half bedroom kind of a thing, as two bedroom and a study, uh, that, whole, that, that part of the house is going to take center space. You know, this work from home or no work from home, you know, we may get back to new normal, but the provision to be able to have a place where your kids can go online schooling, your, uh, your, you yourself can have wonderful work from home, your kids can have work from home, is going to be an extremely important. That private space is going to be extremely important. Already, um, uh, furniture manufacturers are toying with the idea of coming out with pods and everything, which you can place with your own acoustics, with the connectivity and everything. So I think that part of the housing segment is going to take um, a new meaning. I also feel, and I've been advocating the fact that, I, as I spoke in the beginning, that vertical gardens, you know, just because you're living in a flat doesn't mean that you can't have a patch of green in your balcony. It does not mean that you can't grow a little bit of vegetable or something like that. Uh, there are enough examples in this entire world to have vertical gardens in your balconies, have a little vertical uh, 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 vegetable patch or something like that, which allows you to be able to, in times like this, have at least a little approach to, to survival, you know, that kind of a thing. So that's the other thing that, that can come about. I think the important thing, as, as I would like to say, is that the mindless materialism that had come into our into our uh, way of working, you know, that needs to change. It's not the design approach, but the whole thing about, you know, you want because you have so many companies, you have so many vendors, you have so many explosion of material, you want to do this. So that also, as an architect, you they become your tool of expression. And I think that needs to change. That had led to mindless materialism. You know, something, if you can do with a simple white marble, no, you want to try a quarry in Egypt or you want to try a quarry in Italy or, or, or wherever, Greece, and you want a particular kind of a marble. And that really didn't add much value to your project or design, but it was there because you're an architect, you're playing God, so you want this material, that material. I think that mindless materialism has to go out of our business. 
we need to rethink on that basis. You know, just because we are allowed that blue sky thinking doesn't mean that we have no uh, nothing to hold us back, rein us back. It's time to let the ideas get reined back in reality, in reality, and in the realms of of physical, physically uh, reachable. The the supply chain has to become shorter. We have to start working with a much shorter supply chain when things are within your control. And I think that's what is going to lead to our project uh, implementation faster. That's going to benefit both the architect, the architect, the client, and the project. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, there is a follow-up question to this from Jayesh Vora from Jaipur. Uh, he wants to ask to all panelists: it's Like glass being a transparent material, will it be the future product post-COVID? What's your views on like that particular like, aspect? It will. Yeah, Carl says it will. It is. It is. Uh, even I don't today, want to be the first one to material. answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> it is an important material. But but the big man is saying yes. No, I, <laughs> it is. I mean, glass is. is yeah. Problem. I think glass. As I was saying, the mindless uh, use of glass in this part of the world. Yes. Uh, disregarding the orientation. Uh, I also feel that it's become an easy tool for architects because architects don't have to do anything. The moment any part of the building goes into a shop drawing and not a working drawing, I don't consider that architecture. And the moment you're talking about structural glazing, it's a shop drawing. It's not an architect's domain. So I don't consider, honestly, if you ask me, I don't consider glass as part of an architect's vocabulary at all. It is there as a prerequisite because it allows you a puncture to be able to look up. But no, it's not your domain because I do not know the quality of glass. I do not, as an architect, understand the the uh, what the properties of glass. It's you know when somebody says the U value, this value, that value. I really, honestly, do not understand. All I know that it gives me transparency. It's for the air conditioning people. It's for the acoustic people and all that to know about the glass. So something which is out of my domain, not my tool, not my cup of tea, not my vocabulary. You know, uh, in terms of uh, glass. Uh, I think in the early part of the 20th century, where you had Mies van der Rohe, uh, he was the third director of the Bauhaus, and you know all the uh, modernist masters who came around that time set up this vocabulary of using at that time glass as a very unique material, tubular steel, and that became the metaphor for the international style, the new way of design, and that became extremely ubiquitous because people were then creating these glass boxes irrespective of context or climate or indigenous material. So a tower in, um, you know, in Sydney would look the same as the tower in uh, Bombay or in uh, you know, Chicago. So all of this then just started to become a way to express a commonality. Well, today, in fact, that commonality has given way for indigenous and unique expression. In these times of isolation, you actually want a habitat for yourself that reflects hopefully more of who you are and less of the common thread that people have been using to universally create a language of design. So people need to find that inner voice and in, you know, like the monks go away into the hills, the Tibetan monks and you, this time of uh, hibernation and, uh, just incubation has hopefully created an expression wherein more of who we are has come to the fore. And that expression will then be unique and each person will have his and her own voice to express it. So uh, I think glass will have an expression in as much as it's valid in the uniqueness yeah. of its landscape. Um, just Actually, going back, I, I want like to, to make a... Sorry. Sorry, I just want to make one point. Sure, Going back to the question of how things will change post-COVID or materials will change. I think uh, one thing I think you know, all of us are actually uh, pointing out to that point is sustainability and well-being will no longer be an option. Everything, every project, sustainability and health and well-being of the people who are using it, where we're putting it, everything will become the center of every project. And I think then how we choose to use materials more consciously, um, sustainably and suitably. So whether if glass is suitable, yes, of course. 
But if it's not, do we really want to use it? I think that's things. I think that focus will change, um, and it has to. I don't think it's an option anymore to say we'll layer on sustainability later. I think it needs to start uh, right from the beginning. Absolutely. I agree with sorry, the, Ezra. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Ezra. Go ahead. That's okay. Who's speaking? Uh, sorry. Yeah, actually, Ezra. actually, okay. Uh, I I didn't want to answer uh, immediately because. Uh, I believe that glass is a miraculous material and my answer will not be objective due to my beliefs. So, uh, but thank you for all your uh, sharings. Uh, I would like to also answer one of the questions because one of the attendees uh, uh, asked us, what about natural daylight? Uh, actually, I didn't mention in my um, presentation because I believe that uh, this uh, panel is about interior architecture. That's why I didn't mention, but let me make an ad addition. Uh, actually, human health is very, very important and natural uh, daylight has a big role in human health. Uh, before COVID, we were spending 80% of our lives in buildings. After COVID, probably it is uh, much more, but uh, there are numerous research about natural daylight. Uh, and for example, uh, in education buildings, uh, the, um, uh, the success of uh, students are increasing when they uh, enjoy the natural daylight. Uh, the patients at the hospital, their, uh, their uh, amount of medicine taking, the amount of medicine they are taking are decreasing uh, when, uh, when they are having natural daylight. Same as well for shops. The sales at the shops are increasing due to daylight. So daylight is extremely important in our life. And uh, glass is the only material uh, which provides us natural daylight. It's a barrier between uh, the outside world and uh, our buildings. And uh, there are various solutions, uh, various types of products uh, according to your project needs. So of course, uh, I mentioned during my speech uh, about uh, responding COVID immediately in our daily life in buildings. Uh, but uh, we are continuously uh, giving last consultancy to projects in order to uh, offer the right class solution. So uh, I think I already answered question of Kristen and Rama. Sure. I heard, Al, you wanted to add something, uh, yes. Uh, before. See, uh, glass as a material, first and foremost, it's an in inert material. It's the easiest to clean. It cleans it itself, you know, when, when rain falls on it. Uh, we all choose to sit near the window in a house. We all want the window seat in the plane. You know, we want the moon roof in the car. You know, we, uh, we want to be in the veranda. We are hardwired to respond well to the, to the natural environment. And glass is the only material that allows you to be as close to nature as you possibly can. So, yes, Vivek, just give me a minute. So, absolutely, you're right. Glass <laughs> allows you to be as close to light, no glass, as you possibly can. But having said that, it, this does not mean that you just wrap a, a building in glass. I think that used to be the case. Architects have learned more and more about glass over time. Uh, uh, we are taking biophilic design extremely seriously, uh, doing a lot of studies of various orientations, what to use, what to use. For example, we're doing an institute now where the classrooms are inside and the corridors are outside because the site is such that the only way to place a building is east-west, facing east-west. But the, I, I, I mean... I absolutely don't agree with the fact that we need to demonize glass. It's a fantastic material. And uh, personally, it's for me, it's the best material out there. 
there's no would like uh, Carl to end. I think Ezra, that is something very, very well said. I mean, the you know the glass is the merits simply weigh the demerits. I mean, there are too many merits. By the way, I don't know what's Absolutely. the demerit, but let's see what the audience is saying. You know, our panel has said something on the glass, unanimously in agreement, and judicious selection. And depending on the situation, that you don't overuse it, but you use it discreetly, judiciously, as Carl said. But let's see what our, uh, you know respondents are saying in the gym. Yeah, uh, Rohan, can you show the poll results, please? Because I just want to get their sense. Wow! So this is different before. This no, no. Will accurate and designers witness a complete transformation right. post COVID? No, no. And I fifty-five percent feel that they will. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. And did you could I have just very quickly the other poll which was on the glass, please? Because it's such a lovely question we debated the usage yeah. of glass. Rohan, the okay. second poll. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, audience, please vote for this. Will glass see increased use post COVID nineteen? Yes, maybe no. Panelists, you can also vote, please. So then we get some consensus. So in the meantime, on the first question of whether things will change completely post COVID, the way architecture, are we are we going to talk about that? Because to I mean, me, we I, will we will just in circle circle on that because I think this question this poll was to go because okay. we were talking glass as a material and you know we heard some very good points from each of the panelists you know I just want to get the sense what audience sure. and their engagement will tell us so I think thirty second is over I think people are fast yeah, we can show the results uh, yeah. Rohan yeah yeah so there you are. So majority says yes. Yeah. So that echoes that, that echoes the sentiments of most of us. And I mean, I for one, of course, love glass for sure. Uh, I mean, it's all around, behind me, or everywhere. And I agree with you as well. There is a lot of daylight. Uh, Supriya mentioned about the wellness, and definitely by using this, you really achieve that. So I think now I'm going to very quickly go back and uh, you know one thing which I really want to touch upon uh, is finally. Is collaboration the way forward? Can practices pool in their expertise to shine, or is design and build a better map model going forward? So I, I know I, I will be getting uh, all kinds, but let me just take one uh, very quickly from Vivek, and uh, let's keep it brief, uh, ladies and gentlemen on the panel. Uh, uh, is collaboration, Vivek? Your smile tells it's very mischievous all the time. No. Uh, so go ahead and be mischievous. Yeah, I think it's time the architects take onus of everything that they do. You know, for far too long we have been shying away from liability. For far too long we have been ceding ground to other uh, uh, domains. You know, the PMCs have come; they started eating up on our uh, thing, and we we have also started falling back and not taking onus of things that we do. Um, I think it's time for an architect to start building like a master craftsman. That doesn't mean that I'm not for collaboration. I'm saying. Collaborate with everybody, all stakeholders, but be the one who calls the shots. You know, because the whole process of collaboration, if it leads to betterment of a project, for faster implementation of a project, and everything in synergy, then it is all right. But the moment you start collaborating and everybody is singing a different tune, and your job is to then get everybody on the same page, and then start constructing, and then there are delays, and then the PMCs are. Blaming you, or the client is not paying the contractor, and things like that, and the project cycle, the construction cycle increases for purely for that reason. Uh, for that reason, I am not saying that collaborations are the best answer. I wish an architect's office start having all disciplines within their office. I know it's not possible, but Carl, I don't understand. I I do, do not know about Perkins and you guys. You have. All the consultants within your own organization. Why can't a large firm take onus of the project that they're doing without going to any other outside consultant? Have the best talent, like you have the best architectural talent. Why can't you have hired the best talent for MEP for structures and have everything in house so that you are answering to your client? Because, because the best, yeah, yeah, Carl, the best structural engineer and the best MEP engineer will not work in an architect's office. If he's smart, he'll go and open his own office. And I'll tell you, the one of the best. But office. that holds that holds true for architect also. 
isn't it? Yes. The best architect will also go and open the another office. So you're doing making do with some. See, there is a question of collaborating with equal or better people, and then leading to a project of a different nature in where there is virtue of excellence of each one. And then there is the other way of collaborating where you have in-house facility for everything. And like the master architect, you are taking onus of everything. So you know your design philosophy. You hire a like-minded structural engineer. You know why? A design thinking. We don't think design. There has to be design thinking in everything. An architect can do the design thinking. You don't have to think design every time. You know, in India, design thinking will work better. Design thinking in every project will work better because you know. You know, you give the brief to structural engineer. I don't want to see this beam. I don't want to see this cantilever. I want to go ahead this. I want this curve. All the brief has gone from you. After that, it's just a mechanical or structural calculation, mathematical calculation. I'm sure a talent that you hire will be able to deliver. Very well. Right? May, it's, may it's, I? Yeah. yeah. Please, I, I just wanted uh, Vivek. I understand uh, well, for the audience, Vivek is come strongly saying he's not up for collaboration. He, but in the same breath, he also says that yes, he's to a certain extent, and he's educating other architects to become complete entity in house, do a lot of right. backward integration and everything. Not possible. But Carl is vigorously nodding his head, and I am, I presume, and I understand that yes, he is in favor of uh, collaboration. Let me get Supriya. In. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, just to answer your question, Vivek, about why can't you hire the talent? I think for a large firm that does fourteen different practice areas, the even the talent required for MEP or structure for each of these practice areas is different. You can't possibly hire all those structural engineers or MEP. I also disagree with the thing that you're saying that design thinking will only starts with architects. I think structural engineers. MEP engineers, everybody thinks creatively, and they have to to our project to make successful. And when you specialize and exp expertise in your field and collaborate, is when you get the best out of your team. Of so I think collaboration and specialization. Uh, and coming together is is very important. Let me get uh, to, uh, let, let me just quickly get Husna's point because we are talking sure. about a large front collaboration. But I understand. Yeah, Husna, would you like to make a comment on collaboration? Uh -huh. Uh, there's one dictum we all have to live by, and that is we have to pass the baton to the next generation. Do we have all the answers? Absolutely not. To think that we sit in our offices and we wield the power to know all the information it will take to move into the new world with a new paradigm might not be assessing ourselves in the best light. I definitely think the world is an exciting place and there are beautiful minds out there with immense opportunities for constant dialogue, conversations. You can meet a stranger on the street and have a conversation which will trigger an idea inside of you. So I think that we have to be completely open to the beauty around us, to the power, to the energy, to the magic, and engage in these conversations, both on an intellectual as well as a poetic and sublime level. And we have to constantly update and upscale our design information. What we know today needs to be more valid and relevant tomorrow and the day after. So to grow, we need people and we need to take these people with us on every level, both from the point of view of the people who inspire us and we learn from and the people who we share this information to within our realms. So uh, this is no longer a question of... Uh, the aesthetic of indulgence or the aesthetic of beauty. It is now about whether the next 25 years, and that's all we have to upset the status quo and give our children a world in which they will be able to simply exist. And for that, we have to learn. We have to move forward and we need to make ourselves open to every kind of learning. But for I'm that, very we tempted, also need no, to I'm, deal with today. I'm very, I want to say one small yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, a little bit further to what Husna said and what Supriya said. I think uh, having everything in-house, for at least if I have to think about it, simply means we are limiting ourselves to that ability. The ability that people offer you from the outside world is unbelievably... Uh, I mean, why only collaboration with other engineers? I'm talking about collaboration with architects, collaboration with master planners. 
the i mean there's definitely somebody out there who knows more about a certain subject than you and if you don't collaborate then you can only do so much but if you want to do all of that if your appetite is large and if you want to do all of that then the best answer is collaboration so don't bite more than what you can chew you know that's the answer it's as simple as that the thing is you know again i'm talking about only architectural projects do not have a deadline they are open ended you know a car production is very definitive you know how many cars or how many motor parts or how many tabs or whatever can be produced in every day but a, a architectural project has no timeline and you know that's the reason where our profession is failing what we need to ensure is as i said and that's why the reason i'm saying i'm not against collaboration please read me again i'm saying i'm for collaboration as long as that leads to gain for everybody as long as everybody sticks everybody is ethical you know everybody has timelines and fantastic otherwise it is time because you know who gets the blame when the project get delayed not the structural engineer not the mep guy only the architect because the end point is architect he is the cog in the wheel but the onus is on the architect when the onus is on the architect right from municipal drawings to sanctioning to any deviation in the plan to anything failing it's not the mep structural engineer ever will go to the jail if a building falls if it is not confirming to seismic zone if it is not confirming to fire safety regulation it's the architect so it's time for an architect to take onus of everything right today that's Just my point about the modalities and the actual intricacies of the processes i think the only point that's being made here is that uh we are talking about a world that's ever changing and right. unpredictable and wherein we all have to keep ourselves uh open to the idea that we don't have all the answers and they can come from the most surprising places for which the engagement is essential it's not that doesn't mean that we don't deal with it you know we have to deal with that today for tomorrow to come we we cannot shirk our responsibility of today tomorrow will come irrespective whether we are there or no the next generation 25 50 years will happen irrespective of us we as our responsibility as professional as architect as human being is to deal with our today as long as we deal with it consensuously i think our tomorrows will be better our tomorrows will definitely be good if we each one of us starts dealing with our today well i think that's that's the way we need to engage with now that engagement with now is to live in that moment is extremely important oh this was a kind of a debate uh, can i <laughs> you know i think it calls for another <laughs> panel another an hour or so but yes i think uh, absolutely relevant points and i think even in our profession you know time and again we believe there are somebody outside who's more knowledgeable and more experienced i think you collaborate you know for various objectives and if you are a one entity who's completely in command like somebody in the chat said you know architect if he gets a full control uh, then only design and build otherwise no right so uh, well we can go on talking and you know debating on this but let me just quickly try and the you know the, i can also see the time and uh, if you want to take one question from the audience because a lot of people are reaching me my whatsapp phone and everything you want to take this one otherwise they'll feel very bad you are mute you are mute in the ji and this is pa the power of collaboration take everybody together to get these people who are 93 70 and we are talking something doing something i don't want to ask let these guys ask in the audience please yeah this is something interesting it's like i don't know where is it coming from but uh, this means like the name is not mentioned but they want to ask will architect as a profession exist after 2025 a couple of years down the line with uh, uh, ai technology and more over the supreme court ruling allowing uh, anyone who, who who wants to design can practice architecture without a degree so will architecture as a profession exist after a couple of years oh boy oh boy who wants to take it <laughs> <laughs> listen uh, uh, are not architects and some of the most amazing minds of the world whether it's frank lloyd wright miss van der rohe peter zamtor tadao ando they don't have an architectural degree and there are people who you know we look at with nothing but awe so like i said right at the beginning architecture and architectural degrees are two very different things and it's the living of a very rich life beating 
uh, uh, you know, and marching to a uh, rhythm inside of you that's completely, uh, you know, lofty, that really creates the architect and not necessarily the, the study of a practice or the following of any kind of dogma or dictate. So, Carl, would you like to make a comment here? That Husna obviously said. A requirement for shelter. <laughs> The architect is inside of you. He doesn't come with a shiny law, a degree. Yeah. So I think I might to just say in one sentence, as long as you can remain relevant, your profession will also remain relevant. I love these one-liners, man. <laughs> 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 Do you have another one? So I really want to say that audience, we collaborate, we are collaborating with you. Anybody else? Yeah, there are 93, don't take everything. Man. But we have no, I guess friends, like we are running out of time. So you can miss, like uh, take an opinion from the panel. And, yeah, and... Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I think, you know, there are, this is just getting richer, warmer. Excitement is just coming up. And I can see, you know, panelists have also warmed up. And uh, thank you, Vivek, for bringing, bringing that little, little amount of disagreement, which is always healthy. <laughs> you know, not every time you say yes to everything. POVs, 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 yes to all right. So, you know, I'm just loving this and, you know, to love this, uh, to moderate this session. But let me get back, you know, when we started, I started people, all of you come from unique practices and there has been a certain uh, thing that we wanted to drive this conversation to. And a lot of people who are attending are trying to look for that answer and hopefully audience, you would have got a lot of knowledge here. But let me take those final bullet points from each one of them. You know, 30 seconds, 35 seconds, be discreet about this, please. Uh, let us know one messaging by each one of you on the business of architecture, because I'm told by my uh, backend team, there are a lot of young architects there. The messaging for the young architects who are coming into this world to, do, to change this world. And architects are definitely the nation builders. What is that 30 second message that you want to give on two folds to the young architects? And also, how do you see the business of architecture? Is that clear? Uh, I may start if you want. All right. Yes, ma'am. I believe the start days will end uh, sooner or later. Next year, uh, when we remember year 2020, uh, we will forget all the difficulties we faced and probably enjoy the results of the innovative ideas that we created uh, during this pandemic uh, time together. Of course, the business of architecture will continue. And of course, we will have architects with degree or without degree. That doesn't matter, I believe, in, uh, in 2025, too. Let me get Carl in. So for people listening, you mentioned before uh, young architects. I believe I'm also a young architect. Uh, for people <laughs> listening, uh, frankly, absolutely, uh, you know, the way architecture was perceived 60, 70, 80 years ago, we refer to as the masters. Yes, they are the masters, but with the tools that they perceived architecture, with the limit of the imagination with which they perceived architecture, that has changed today. The way we operate our lives, you know, we are digital, we are collaborating on platforms, the world is smaller. You know, you know, respect the past, learn from it, but don't be afraid of the future. You know, if, if something tells you that red is better. I'm than so sorry, Sunday, your voice dropped. Can you repeat yourself, please? I'm saying respect the past, learn from it. But, you know, if, if something tells you red, blue, purple is better than gray, white and beige, go for it. I mean, don't uh, listen to what uh, somebody or elder than you told you. That's architecture in a nutshell. Very well, very well. So let me now uh, take uh, Husna in uh, this last 30 seconds, 35 seconds. Make your dreams bigger than yourself and be prepared to fall, be prepared to burn, be prepared to tumble, be prepared to protect them with all of your being. Uh, eventually, if you chip away hard enough, you will come through. People will fly with you and they will enjoy that journey. But just constantly believe that you need to uh, be unafraid of taking those chances and make sure that you're overpowered. You wake up and you sleep with the belief that it is bigger than you. Be possessed. Wow. Be possessed. 
Uh, uh, Supriya? Um, I'm not sure where the question started, but I think it was about... I will, uh, I will tell you. Uh, you know, we, 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 there's such a lot of passion coming with each of the panelists. <laughs> uh, I asked, uh, you know, there are, there are an audience that is a lot of young architects. So messaging for them. And what is yeah. the messaging from the, the panel topic itself, the business of architecture? Younger, younger um, architects before. Yeah, younger, yeah. <laughs> younger, yeah, yeah. So I think... I also, uh, I also got lost. See. <laughs> I think Indrajit had mentioned, you know, about business of architecture as being managing your money, managing clients' money, but I think it's about managing your people. Um, and that's what I want to tell everybody who runs architectural business or, arch, you know, architectural uh, practices that nurturing talent keeping, uh, taking care of your uh, young staff and managing talent, managing resources is what the business is about. Once you have a team that uh, feels nurtured, feels creative, feels taken care of, the product that comes out of it, your clients are happier, your, your products is much nicer. So I think uh, more than managing money, more than managing your a fee, it's managing your team and managing your talent. Um, and uh, for all the young people or younger people out there, I think you should know that that's what we want to do. As, as people who run these businesses, we want to take care of you and your talent. So that's a company which, uh, you know, I, I mean, has about 1,000 people working for them. Vivek, I, I saved you for the last. <laughs> Go for it. Architecture is not a business. It's not a business. It's an emotion. So to everybody, to all the young people out there who think that architecture is a profession where you'll make money, I've said, <laughs> and I'm saying it again, it's not a low hanging fruit. It's not cherry pickings. You know, you have to be in this emotion with all your heart and with all your dreams. I always say heart is supposed to be very fragile. Heart breaks, but heart is pumping away 70 times a minute till you die. Dreams are extremely resilient. Dreams are what take you to another level. Dream is what you need to do to become a successful architect. Don't, don't treat architecture as a business. There are no, there are no what you call as uh, balance sheets in architecture. You know, the, 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 the joy that you have of seeing your building, uh, nobody who makes money can show his safe or his bank account to people and say, this is the money that I made working. But an architect can pass around and go and show a building to his generations, to his friends, to his family, every time he passes by and say, this is the building that I created. I think the joy of being in that profession outbeats any profession that you can be in. So treat architecture as an emotion and the emotional wealth that you will have will far, far outweigh any other wealth that you can earn any time in your life. And there is enough money to be made in architecture. All the panelists here are uh, proof of that, excepting me, I think. Rest everybody, yeah. So, so yeah, that's my, that's my giveaway. As somebody so, back that's the only one with the skylight. Sorry. Somebody, somebody Vivek said, That's it, you're the only one with the skylight. <laughs> I know, without a glass. No. <laughs> you know, Vivek. I tried to create an artificial halo around me because there was none. We <laughs> make do with windows. I tell you. <laughs> Gee. Yes, before you were saying. No, I was saying, well, you were saying somebody said very interesting. Great said, sir, with a lot of emotion and passion. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one and a half hours have gone and we still want to go ahead and we can go another half an hour, one and a half hours. But yes, at, at this point of time, I would like to conclude. I want to thank my panel for extremely, you know, uh, you know, discussing and being with us, spending time with us and sharing their knowledge and wisdom here and completely speaking from their heart. I mean, they come from large practices and very established, uh, you know, people in the discipline. But what they spoke, they spoke truly of their heart. And Ezra, uh, ma'am, you rightly said, when we meet in 2021, we enjoy working together, being innovative, ideas, architects with degree, without degree, does, does not make any sense. You have to do what you do at best and you should have your heart there. And um, I think um, then we heard about that world is a smaller place. 
respect the past, embrace the new. And Carl said, be ready all the time experimenting. It is not important that you have to have one tunnel vision. Keep, keep your blinkers on all the time. Learn from each other, work together. Large practices definitely need to collaborate and get the best brains in. And then I think uh, Hushna said, dreams make bigger, believe and be unafraid and try and do everything possible. Don't limit yourself. It will make your dreams bigger than yourself. And um, um, Supriya, you come from really a large corporate firm and you really looked about people. You say it's not money is not important. Clients are definitely important. But what is paramount of importance is that we need to take care of our people. And I, for one, absolutely wholeheartedly agree that you take your people together, nurture them, yeah. take care of them. They are the ones who will make the difference for you, for your company, for the society and the whole world. So I uh, you know, agree that manage your resource. They will show you the way. They will show you the winning. They will show you the dollars. Whatever you want, you want it. They are the ones. They are the key to the success. And Vivek, my friend, as always, heart beats 70 times and that keeps you thriving. He doesn't believe it's a business because he's very passionate in what he does. And young, younger force there who's listening, watching, you know what he says, take it, own it. It's like Shraddhav, if I may use Hindi. And Husna was, I know, about tempted to ask. It's like the spiritual awakening working. And I thank you, Husna, for bringing that passion. The human aspect of it, you know, it's very important. People step up from your, from your roles, from your profession, and come together as human. Think of people together, work together, collaborate, hold each other's hand. You will walk past this tough times. So I think lots and lots have been said. And if I miss something, you know, we will obviously cover it in our magazine. And I offer one also became very uh, emotional about it. You know, uh, we've been all there for so many days inside cocoon and locked up in a house. But when we talked here and I see my lovely panel there, I feel that I'm already outside. And, you know, so much of joy. I, I experience it. And yes, people. Uh, you know, there are so many 99 plus more questions, please. My apologies from my team on, my beha on behalf of us. But, you know, this panel has given us a lot of optimism, lots of entre entrepreneurship that I see there. I think we are in safe hands. There is so much of positivity. There is so much already, a, you know, collaboration that I see happening. So, ladies and gentlemen, a big thank you from ITP. And I thank you for making this audience. You've been very kind. You've been with us all through. And that's what we want. So thank you very much once again. And these days, people say, Vivek has a hand. So as long was... as Esra is inviting us to Istanbul, not yes. virtually, <laughs> but physically, it's all all right. You know, <laughs> the takeaway has to be a... Is that all right, Esra? It's not a virtual invitation, all right? Looking... Looking forward to seeing there. you in 2021 in Istanbul. Yeah. We will have a wonderful like tour. Okay. Absolutely. So I, really wanted to, I wanted to give it a line to end, but I think thank you, Vivek. Uh, that's a very, very positive way. Yes, Ra, we are all going to be with you in Istanbul. And once again, audience, thank you very much. And thank you, Husna. Thank you, Supriya. Thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you. you, Vivek. Thank, thank you, Mithali And my wonderful team behind, Rohan, and all the lovely marketing people, Mithali Vritti, for doing the damn good job to making the so many numbers come up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.